We've been tracking an important story of uh, potential academic censorship, and we're very excited to wa welcome to Kenneth Roth uh, to speak about this. He was the executive director of Human Rights Watch from 93 to 2022. He's currently writing a book, and let's go ahead and put this recent op-ed from Mr. Roth on the screen here. He says, I once ran Human Rights Watch. Harvard blocked my fellowship over Israel. Uh, welcome to the show, sir. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, of course. So just uh, tell us what happened here. Well, when I announced that I would be leaving Human Rights Watch last April, um, I was planning to leave as of the end of August. I very quickly received a call from the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, which is part of the Harvard Kennedy School. And they asked, would I be interested in being a senior fellow there during the current academic year so I could work on my book there? And we went back and forth a little bit, and I basically said, yes, you know, that, that sounds like a good idea. And we thought that that was pretty much a done deal. There was one technical step that still needed to be taken. We needed the sign-off of Dean Douglas Almendorf, the head of the Kennedy School. But we assumed that that would be just a mere formality. And so I actually, um, over the summer, contacted Almendorf and said, look, it, I'm going to be there in September. Let's get to know each other. And we arranged a, a Zoom conversation and had a very pleasant half-hour chat until the end. And then he asked me this weird question. He said, do you have any enemies? <laughs> now, this is odd for me because, you know, I've got a gazillion enemies. I mean, <laughs> I, I've, I've headed Human Rights Watch for three decades. You know, we document government's human rights violations, criticize them for it. They hate that. So many of them hate me. And I, I you know, ran through that with Elmendorf. I said, well, you know, the Chinese government and the Russian government have personally imposed sanctions on me. I mentioned the Saudi government and the Rwandan government particularly to test me. But, you know, I had an idea what he was driving at. So I said, and also the Israeli government doesn't like me. And that turned out to be the kiss of death because two weeks later, I got a phone call from my friends at the, at the car center who had to sheepishly admit that Dean Elmendorf had vetoed my fellowship because of my and Human Rights Watch's criticism of Israel. Wow. I mean, it's outrageous. And this is something I want to focus on with you specifically, because you named a, set, a number of other governments. One of uh, the uh, accusations, I believe, that was leveled against you is that you uh, disproportionately spend time criticizing Israel, uh, whereas those appear to be ones where it might be more controversial. But, you know, lay out uh, your other track record, not just Israel, but everything that you covered while you were there for three decades. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's an odd accusation because, I mean, first of all, if you just look at the facts, Israel is one of 100 governments that Human Rights Watch regularly reports on. So, you know, it's like one, maybe 2% of our work. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of our work. So to say that we're disproportionately focused on Israel is just, you know, ridiculous. But, but the other thing is that the people who make that allegation, there are, there's a sort of cottage industry of little groups of, of partisan defenders of the Israeli government. Um, and they, in their view, you know, the Israeli government has never in the history of the world committed a human rights violation. They devote themselves to attacking anybody who criticizes Israel. And then, you know, that epitome of bias, they have the audacity to claim that we're biased because we impartially apply the same factual and legal standards to Israel as we do to everybody else. It's just absurd. Yeah, and I don't think there's any doubt uh, when you apply that same criticism to one of the, you know, adversaries of the United States government, let's say in Iran or Syria or another nation, there isn't nearly the same level of pushback. Um, I'd love to delve into some of the, the facts and reality here. Uh, at Human Rights Watch, you all authored uh, a report that I followed very closely titled, this was April 27, 2021, A Threshold Crossed Israeli Authorities and the Crimes of Apartheid and Persecution. What is the critique that you level there? And obviously the, the word apartheid, very strong. What is the evidence that you use to bolster that claim? Yeah, I think you're right for bringing that up because I think that that is you know, a lot of what's behind this, this veto of, of my fellowship. But um, what we did, we were not making very explicitly, not making an historical analogy to South Africa. Rather, we were applying international law. And there are two relevant treaties here. There's the UN Convention Against Apartheid, and then there's the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And this sets forth fairly clearly, you know, these are the legal standards. And then in a you know 200-page report, which was incredibly detailed, we outlined 
you know, why there was this oppressive discrimination against Palestinians. And, you know, if you spend time in the West Bank, it actually is pretty obvious. You know, you have these, you know, well-developed, beautiful Israeli settlements where, um, you know, Israelis get to live under civil law with the full freedoms of an Israeli citizen. And then, you know, right next door in Area C of the West Bank, you'll have these Palestinian villages where they can't even add a bedroom without getting it demolished. You know, they have to travel on, on separate roads. They need passes to get through checkpoints. I mean, it has all the hallmarks of apartheid. And the real question, I mean, we I've been asked, why didn't you call it apartheid earlier? And I, I think that's, you know, that's a fair question. But for many years, when we would point out this oppressive discrimination, people would say, oh, yeah, but you know, don't worry, there's the peace process. Once we have peace, all this will be taken care of. And that defense just stopped being credible because there is no peace process right now. It's completely moribund. The current government is going in the opposite direction from any conceivable two-state solution. And so we just you know, looked at the reality today. We're not gonna assess the future. We just said, what's it today? And there's just no question that it's apartheid. This is what Human Rights Watch found. This is what Beth Selim, the leading Israeli group, found. This is what Amnesty International found, and you know a plethora of other groups as well. So, I mean, that's just the ugly reality. I wish it wasn't so, but it is what it is. Yeah, and and you know, look, even if you disagree, I don't think that's grounds for. I mean, I mean the idea that Harvard is supposed to be like endorsing all of the. Uh, like the opinions of its fellows. I mean, that seems pretty ridiculous in an academic uh, point of view. My question also is, do you have any idea who, the, why, where did the pressure on the dean come from? So was it you know, above his pay grade? Is it donor-based? Like what's happening? Yeah, well, first, let me just pick up on your earlier point, which yeah. is to say, you know, this is the Kennedy School. So the Kennedy School was supposed to be the nation's you know, foremost policy institute where they teach you know, tomorrow's, the next generation of leaders how to deal with domestic policy and how to deal with foreign policy. You know, how you address the Israeli government, um, you know, given its rightward dangerous trend, is the classic thing that Kennedy School students should learn about. But evidently, Dean Elmendorf doesn't want them to hear you know, an impartial perspective as Human Rights Watch would present. He invites literally 10 Israeli officials to the Kennedy School every single year, but they're all partial. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But an impartial observer like, like me, like Human Rights Watch, no, apparently that's not okay. Now, what was going on behind the scenes? Um, we know that it was because of my criticism of, of Israel. Elmendorf has said that to Catherine Sickink, a, a very respected professor at the Kennedy School. And he also told Matthias Rees, the faculty director of the Carr Center, that people who mattered to him objected to my fellowship. Wow. Now, we don't know what that means. You know, um, he doesn't seem to have a personal strong view on Israel, but who these people who mattered to him were, you know, were they donors? The, the Nation, Michael Massing's article in The Nation outlined a number of very big donors to the Kennedy School who were big supporters of Israel. Did he consult with them? Did he surmise what they would think? Was it some other influence that undermined academic freedom? We don't know, but but the bottom line is the message that Harvard is sending is disastrous. It's suggesting that you know if you criticize Israel, that's the third rail that yeah. will compromise your academic career. Yeah, well, we actually have that Nation article. We can put that tear sheet up on the screen uh, that tracks some of the significant contributors and donors to Harvard and um, their their pro-Israeli stances, and asks whether this is you know the reason whether these were the people that mattered to the dean that ultimately uh, axed your fellowship there. And part of what I hate about this is, frankly, uh, the dean by taking these sort of actions plays into some of the anti-Semitic tropes about, you know, a, a cabal behind the scenes, well-moneyed, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I mean, that's one of the angles of this that I find uh, disturbing and problematic. But you know, listen, you're writing a book, you're, you're well-established in your career, you're gonna be just fine, you didn't necessarily need this fellowship. So what do you think is the bigger, broader lesson here? Why, do you, why did you feel it was important to take your personal story public? Well, you're absolutely right. This is not compromising my future. I'm fine. I have plenty of options because I've, you know, I've been leading Human Rights Watch for three decades. So I will go someplace else. I am already someplace else, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll continue finding other opportunities. But as I said, I really worry about, you know, the younger academic, the the junior scholar, even the student, who, you know, when they look at the situation, might honestly want to criticize Israel, but now says, "Oh, well, I better not." 
this may really cost me my future. And, you know, Dean Elmendorf at the Kennedy School seems at this point paralyzed. I mean, it's just hard to know um, what he's going to do. So we've appealed to Lawrence Bacow, the president of Harvard, to step in because this is really, you know, Harvard's reputation that is at stake. And, you know, if anybody can stand up to donor pressure, if anybody can offer a principled defense of academic freedom, it's Harvard, the richest university in the world. You know, when I ran Human Rights Watch, you know, if somebody came to me and said, you know, here's some money, but we want you to exempt our favorite country, I would say, no, we're not the organization <laughs> for you. You right. know, we have to like, you know, apply equal standards to everybody. And that's just the cost of being principled. Harvard can afford to do the same thing. It can announce that regardless of donor pressure, regardless of external pressure, they are not going to compromise academic freedom. They are going to uphold intellectual independence. Excellent you know, point, If Harvard sir. can't do that, who can? Yeah, Excellent such point. a great point. I mean, forty-two this is, billion dollar endowment. Exactly. I mean, yeah. they if they lose a few donations, yeah. they're going to be just fine. Um, thank you so much for fun. taking the time. Good luck in the next endeavor. Let us know when the book comes out so we can talk to you about that as well. Uh, really grateful to get to talk yeah. to you today, sir. I enjoy talking to you, sir. Thank you. That'd be great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Absolutely. our pleasure. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Uh, maybe it'll piss some people off. Don't particularly care. But listen, we care a lot about censorship in all realms of our society here. And this is one which uh, you're probably not going to hear about in some of the conservative press that often talks about it. So it's important to give people a fulsome picture of everything that's going on in our society. This is a major one, too, which, look, as an American, the idea that you can't criticize anybody and you know not face pressure like this and supposedly the nation's premier academic institution, that really pisses me off. When I went to Georgetown for my graduate degree, I walked past a sign every single day saying this building was donated by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I don't remember anybody batting an eye over that mm -hmm. one. Uh, or any Georgetown faculty getting in trouble for saying it. Well, no, it's not like any of them actually said well, anything. His so, point about yeah. how they welcome 10 yeah. Israeli officials, that's no yeah. problem. Right. Right. They're considered impartial. Yeah. But the head for three decades of Human Rights Watch, that's, that's out of bounds. Like, come on. All right. Insanity. Totally. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for your support to the show so we can highlight stories like this one. And in general, live show tickets, uh, don't go ahead and buy them if you haven't already and get the last couple there. But uh, otherwise, we've got great content for you guys all over the weekend. We'll be back here on Monday for an amazing show, and we love you all. Love y'all. See you Monday. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.